are not common, not not the common environments in which which normally this this exhibit this museum thinks about itself, mm. and also this culture, uh, let's say the Western culture thinks mm -hmm. about itself. Mm. Um, so that's that's in a way the, the approach that we took, and we took it because we in a way are are more uh, more and more uncertain, I guess, on how to relate to our own past, our own um, identity, if you will. Of being a Western museum, and me, and me myself, of course, of being also, let's say, a Western subject in that yeah. sense, yeah. Um, we realize that we that there's a lot of problems in that identity. At the same time, you cannot escape your own skin; it's what you are. Yeah. Um, how do you how do you arrive at another position in which you, yeah, let's say, reflect on that heritage? Let's say both on the things that are not good and on the things that you want to keep. How do you deal with that? And maybe my, my first question to you is: like, What's your um, what's your perspective on if if you can have such a if it kind of a monumental opening question? But what's your perspective on this Western history of modern art? Let's say how 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 do you relate to that? Yeah. Say, that's that world of ideas, almost that system. So to speak. Well, I mean. Um I've I've also grown up in it, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I, I grew up in the Dutch Caribbean, but the Dutch Caribbean is a colonial project, and as a colonial project, it also um, was one of the first places where this idea of Western modernity, um, Western art, Western production of art aesthetics was unleashed in a certain sense, mm -hmm. right? So the idea that I would have a different frame of mind, a different reference, um, I think it's one of the most first, one of the first things that needs to be challenged. Mm -hmm. This notion that I am other, and based on my otherness, I see the world differently. Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, and in that sense, it's really fascinating to understand then that there are different ways of seeing the world. And once you know that, then you can see the Western uh, Eurocentric model of aesthetics, of art, of society, of the world as an option. Right? It's one of the options among many other options of understanding where we're going, what we're doing, how we see ourselves, and how we relate to objects. Um, one of the interesting things about a cabinet such as this is it reminds me of my grandmother's cabinet, right? Where she would put things in there that are only to be taken out um, for when guests arrive. Or, or like my aunt who has like plastic on her couch. Um, no one can sit in the living room. You know, <laughs> this type of idea of what exactly is valuable and what exactly is the use, right? How do you use valuable things in your daily life? So the bench and the, the oriental music, you let a little bit of it uh, play before the recording started, so I get a sense of you know, what you're trying to evoke in this room, and I'm like, okay, if this is a starting point, what is the rest then, right? Yeah, where are we going? <laughs> where are we going? Yeah. Because, I mean, the, the, what you say is, you, you, you start talking about 1936 and Van Alba starting up in that date. It's really fascinating that that is at the height of the decolonization movement um, throughout Indonesia, right? Uh, conversations are going on here in, in the Netherlands as well. So what does that do? And also, um, on the one hand, you have Van Alba, uh, tobacco farmer, um, um, but also Philips right around the corner. So there's a relationship between technology, between colonialism, between the representation of both in this little town. So when you said that this is a little bit off-center, I'm like, hmm, yeah, is yeah. it? Yeah. This, could be, this could be seen as a center in and of yeah. itself. It's under the, the rivier, under the rivers, right? So if you relate, if you look at the geography of the Netherlands differently, then this could be a center where the north isn't anymore, or hasn't been since the VOC stopped. Yeah. But, I mean, it's, it's really an interesting thought to say that, because if you think about Eindhoven not as, a, let's say, an off-center, if you, if you think about it as a center, it's a center like economically, industrially. Yeah? Like it's exactly. one of the few cities within the Netherlands that's really born out of industry. Yeah. It's a, a conglomeration of six or seven villages through the Philips Corporation, uh, and there were other businesses like the tobacco industry here. And um, at the same time, there is a strong sense of, uh, let's say, being off-center in the community here, 
uh, because uh, they, they never felt as a, as a cultural center, mm. as a symbolic center. Mm. And uh, in a way, the idea to bring a museum to this place uh, by one of the industrialists of this region uh, was also, in some sense, inspired by the idea that the, that the community here should gain that kind of self of self awareness, self esteem mm. of being cultured and civilized in that sense. A civic virtue that was something that uh, Van Abel really thought as, a, as, as something that needed to be let's say, brought forward with this museum hmm. in, in Eindhoven. Uh, at the same time, of course, he, he does that on the back of an industry, on the back of a, of a, of a business uh, that, um, uh, let's say, for, for, yeah, has, has, has its relationship to the colonies. Hmm. I mean, brings its tobacco from there. Maybe we should have a look at the, let's have a look. part of the exhibition yeah, that yeah. goes there. This is uh, the second uh, gallery of the exhibition, and in this uh, gallery we are uh, showing artworks, not so much as artworks, but also as documents or objects that are part of a story. And um, we try to, in a way, as we in the first room try to distance ourselves by having a different environment, we here also try to take a different perspective on what art is in the, in the exhibition. And uh, in a sense, we are following a model uh, of what happened to religious uh, artifacts uh, that uh, got into museums after the revolution in, uh, in 1789 in France, and in a way turned from being object of devotion to being object of aesthetic contemplation. And in that sense, were desacralized and in a way artisized, like turned into art. Mm -hmm. And the idea behind this room is that somehow we would like to de artisize the object for a moment. And look at them as kind of let's say ambiguous documents that tell many different stories. And one of the stories in this room, or one of the objects in this room, is a, is a mask, a dead mask from Sumatra. Um, and this mask is now held by the Tropen Museum, the collection of the Tropen Museum. And um, uh, if for us, it, it's it's a, it's a mask that tells two stories. On the one hand, it tells a story about um, the history of modern art, because it were these kind of masks that inspired painters like Picasso to um, go on, uh, let's say, venture on an a perform experiment mm -hmm. and, and change their way of painting, change their way of making, making representations. And at the same time, um, these objects remind of another story, and that is that, um, how did these objects get here? They got here because there were trade relationships with these regions in the world where you could maybe put some quotation marks around the word trade in that sense. Trade. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, let's say we, we, we were pillaging the place, and um, yeah. we were there, um, and and took lots of cultural artifacts to the to 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 Europe, to the West. Brought them first into ethnographic museums, and later exhibited them more or less as though they were autonomous artworks. And um, in that sense, these uh, these cultural documents. They also relate to that history of colonialism and and the way in which yeah the economic system of the West worked for a long time, and also I mean the system out of which this particular museum came. Mm -hmm. You see here a photograph of Henry van Abbe, the founder of the museum, checking testing his tobacco in Amsterdam, mm -hmm. and this was tobacco that was grown in Sumatra, at the region where this where this uh, mask was made, and um, in that sense. Um, this uh, this uh, mask also refers to that yeah, colonial uh, economical history of the museum. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating! It says Frascati here, but not yeah. Frascati is a theater. Yeah, it's the, there. There, there was the tobacco uh, trade um, uh, stations, the, the trade fair yeah, in the in the Frascati. In, in the, the Frascati. Frascati. Yeah. But you know what's weird about that? Then the theater doesn't say anything about that history, right? So now I'm here seeing this and finding out that the location that I've had conversations about colonialism in never refers to itself as a colonialist project, as yeah. a product of that colonial endeavor. So it's interesting to see that, that um, referentiality towards the past is always done outside of the location that it happened. So this is fascinating to see that you guys are tackling it within yeah, the museum. That's also what we, um Let's say, what, let's say the gravity of which I still have difficulty to really comprehend, but 
But see, when we talk about, for instance, a relationship that Picasso had to this, what he then called primitive sculpture, you know, or, or that kind of, uh, to, the, to these uh, masks that come from different cultures, mm -hmm. um, we have a un well, slightly uncomfortable feeling about it in a way because, yeah, he was, yeah, in a way, taking these objects for things that they were not in some way, and in a way, the whole, let's say, idea of primitivism kind of. Yeah, I mean, it, there, there is, a, is a positive sense in the sense that it was a kind of a noble bow in the sense of like these are pure, pure cultures that are better than our corrupted culture. Is I that mean, positive? Yeah. In the 50s, when, when, when the Western culture had more or less destroyed itself, the idea that, let's say, to go to a culture that wasn't Western was yeah. considered to be a way out of, of a, a deadlock or, or, a, or a bad tradition. But, but at the same time, I mean, um, of course, the, it's, you, you project, you, you force uh, a culture in a certain frame, you freeze it in mm, that frame. Exactly, yeah. Uh, yeah. But we don't really talk about this, the, let's say, the economic relationship of how this object at all got into the studio of Picasso yeah. in that sense. Yeah. And so we talk about it kind of from a cultural perspective, but when we talk about, let's say, the material reality of how do these institutions live, exactly. yeah. then indeed yeah. we might, we might maybe we, we really um, are not very willing to think of those relationships. And, yeah. and at the same time, I also I don't really know exactly what this, let's say, what, what should we learn from this. Yeah. Yeah. It's also the notion of what's the consequence of talking about this for your further actions, right? Mm -hmm. So if you know that this, um, this, this mass has a certain type of spiritual life and that was removed, right, through the, through the, the, the becoming part of archives, becoming part of um, collections. What happens then that once you reinscribe the spiritual nature of the object, do you then continue the violence that was done to it by placing it in such a context once mm -hmm. again? Or do you recognize it as a spiritual object that should not be behind a glass plate and should not be in an art museum? What happens then? Is this, is this a continuation of the past while saying, hey, we get the past, but then we get to do it? Or is this a first yeah. step towards actually, you know, saying, hey, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna make sure it doesn't happen again, and also we're gonna return the stuff that we have, or at least have conversations about what it means to repair the damage that was done. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a very nice way to say to us that, uh, let's say, uh, this, this, you, may, you may expose something by exposing something, you don't change anything. So, in that sense, yeah. indeed, uh, it's a gesture uh, that, um, that stays in the realm of the symbolic. Yeah. At the same time, uh, what, I'm thinking, what I'm thinking when, you're, when, you, when you ask the question now is that this, this particular, particular exhibition um, plays uh, very dramatically with the idea of original and copy. Mm -hmm. There are many copies in this exhibition, as there are several originals, and there are also, um, in a way, uh, originals that turned into, or copies that turned into originals, and uh, let's say we, we, we yeah. kind of tackle that, that domain. Um, you, could, you could wonder if it's not, uh, like if you think about the spiritual objects, if we value them primarily for their aesthetic beauty, why wouldn't we work with copies? I mean, we could copy this. And we could, we could, exactly. well, let's say we could still, and yeah. we could know that the copy is, let's say, 99% correct. Exactly. And yeah. then for the other 1%, you have to go to where the copy, where the object came from. Yeah. Um, and yeah, maybe we should, and that's one of the things that we are trying to address with this, 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 maybe the whole project is, mm -hmm. okay, we know that, let's say, the making of modern art, it's, we cannot, we cannot take a, like a unilateral stance on it. We cannot say either it was completely bad or it was completely good. But at the same time, um, we do feel that um, whatever we, wherever we go, we need to let go mm -hmm. of certain parts of it. And maybe one part of it is trying to, let's say, be more flexible and be more pragmatic maybe in yeah. the sense of how do you deal with um, um, with things that inspire you. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's in a way, like, we now keep this original because we want to be sure that this is the one true object. Right? Exactly. Maybe what we value of it is, is, is many other things. Yeah. I think that also comes back to, um, once again, the notion of use of objects, mm -hmm. right? Um, what do you use it for? 
is, is, the, is the intended use this? No. So then the question is, what can be other uses of it now that we know that the intended use is not being adhered to? Mm -hmm. And so it's also this notion of, of uh, possessive ownership, right? You possess it, you take it out of its context, now it's yours, while within that context it was an object of social relations. Yeah. It's, it's a death mass, so it's used for death rituals, talking about someone passing along to a spirit world or um, yeah. for those who still are left behind to cope and deal with the loss. So there's something going on there that's yeah. stripped. So then it reminds me now when, when you talk about making copies, I mean, you have that case of the Nefertiti head, right? Mm -hmm. That was uh, 3D scanned clandestinely, and other plans are out there, and everyone can make their own, yeah, yeah, yeah. Their own version of the Nefertiti head. And I think that's a really fascinating project. Mm -hmm. So it, it moves along the idea and the concept of objects not needing owners, right? Letting go of the ownership aspect of it, yeah. the copyright aspect of it. Yeah. Let's copy everything. But it also, if you copy everything, what exactly is the value then? Yeah. Right? I mean, and like, it's one of the most, uh, uh, let's say, interrelated things of modernity is that copyright or authorship, ownership, these are things that were, yeah, let's say, lived in the West as though they were natural law, or let's say, were there, let's say it's the primary tool of power that was that was there because let's say all the let's say lots of colonial trade was about establishing a monopoly and having let's say the pure ownership, authorship, copyright on a certain product and being able to not share it. And in a way our art concept, our concept of art in that sense really mirrors this mentality. Exactly. But yeah. it's the original, it's the author, it's the uniqueness and yeah, it's and it's I mean it's also uncomfortable for artists because you're in a way forced into a kind of a like a unique creator kind of role, which in a way is a, is a very uncomfortable reference if yeah. you think about that violent economical model with, exactly. to which it relates. Yeah. But in, in that sense, I think I would like to show you one other room in the exhibition, which kind of where we really go deep into the West. Let's say we now are in a weird limbo room, but now let's go deep into. The West. Let's go deep into the West, <laughs> the heart of darkness. Yes. <laughs> 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 now is um, a reconstruction, you could say, of one of the seminal exhibitions of the 20th century, Cubism and Abstract Art, in the Museum of Modern Art in New York. It was in the year 1936. And this in the exhibition, and especially the, the catalogue, which we also have here in, in different forms in the, uh, in the, um, in the exhibition. Uh, the catalogue cover had a schematic representation of the history of modern art, which became the blueprint for collecting modern art in the West, you could say. And also, the Van Abbe Museum, uh, when it made its turn from collecting Dutch and Flemish painting towards international modern art, did it on the basis of this schema. The director, Eddie de Wilde, made a version of the schema to show to the city council of Eindhoven and say, if you want the people of Eindhoven to understand modern art, they need to understand these different positions, so yeah. we need to buy a Picasso, which was insanely expensive at that time. Um, but why I wanted to go here is that, um, in a way, this exhibition, maybe it, it is a moment of is somehow of reconsideration or liberation of the, of the West with its own narrative, because the West was, let's say, in 1936, was about to destroy itself, let's say, the European West in, in the Second World War. Mm. Um, and it was in, in New York that somebody wrote for the first time an exhibition, like a history of modern art that was not based on the principle of national schools or nationality, but was based on um, an international, um, let's say, series of movements of modern art. So suddenly this, this art that was in Europe, maybe trapped somehow in national identity, was liberated in the United States into an international story of modern art. At the same time, the base condition of the story was kept the same. So it was still about ownership, it was about authorship, it was about uniqueness, originality, even much stronger maybe so than, than in Europe, in the sense that uh, Barr was really rigorous, like brutal in saying that like, we're only showing original steps in the history of modern art. And I mean, what I'm, let's say when we were talking earlier about, uh, about the mask and about, let's say, what the use of the mask was, you can ask, like, what was this originality used for in the West? Like, why, why, why we were we so obsessed with this idea of being original? Or, or in, and why, like, if you, if you think about this, uh, this work, which is an 
Mondrian, uh, even if it's not. This is a copy of Mondrian, and it's a copy of the Mondrian that we have in the Bonabo collection. But this work, yeah, for us, it on the one hand, as an image, it's made to um, help find some kind of spiritual balance with the world, uh, like let's say looking attentively at the world and trying to understand how somehow through an image you could find yeah, the expression of a, of a greater idea. And at the same time, uh, the only way to, let's say, the, the model we had in the West to, let's say, to deal, to share these kind of experience with each other was to, these, let's say, to the, to the um, enormous emphasis on the originality and the uniqueness and the, the irrepeatability of this gesture as at the same time if, I mean, I now said that this was a copy, but I'm pretty sure that if people are going to walk to this exhibition, they will not understand immediately which one is the original and which one is the copy. Yeah. Will that mean that they will have less of a spiritual, let's say, revelation looking at the work? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, some of our guides will, will completely say yes. They say the original has a quality which the copy doesn't have. But, I mean, what does that say to, of the Western culture if this is the way in which it, let's say, finds its spiritual expression? Yeah. Uh, yeah. What, what do you think about that? I mean, it, it, it shows... Mm, it shows a lack of understanding of where the spiritual lies, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just in the notion of the singular, it's in the collective. So also if you understand an object or the creation of an object as something that's done in relationship to others, then a copy is in relationship to the original. Mm -hmm. So the copy itself is already a spiritual undertaking because it is yeah, yeah. pushing that towards uh, understanding of relationships and understanding of the object being in relationship to the rest of the, the situation. I mean, if, if, even if you think of like children, right? Children are copies of yourself in a certain sense. I'm a copy of my mom and dad coming together. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know exactly where I'm going with that, but in the, <laughs> but in the sense of, of the creation of um, knowledge surrounding uh, copy, surrounding aura, surrounding spirituality, um, I think it is about the relationships that you connote and that you denote. Yeah. And so if, if it didn't say copy here in the wall, I wouldn't have known, yeah. right? just like you said. Yeah. Because when was the copy made? Around the same time as original, or after it was bought, or? We don't really know. We know, um, let's say, we collaborate with an institution called the Museum of American Art, and they provide many of the copies. And uh, yeah, it's not set when exactly they are made. They're not extremely old, but yeah, um, yeah it's, there's, yeah, these are true copies in the medieval sense of the world, but say we know, we know that they are there, we don't really know them, yeah. and, and uh, we know only that, let's say, they were made to represent the original, uh, to copy the original. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, what, like, when you, when you say, like, the, the spiritual is a sense of collectiveness, what I, say, what I personally, um, learn, but I'm now wondering, let's say, if I manage to somehow, let's say, change my own inner DNA in that way, but, let's say, maybe especially if you are a student of, of art, if you are a student of art, a student of art history as, as I am, but, um, let's say, I really learned to, um, let's say, have an emotional, cognitive relationship in front of an artwork by looking at it, hmm. uh, and I, it's for me a very powerful experience, hmm. like, uh, I can, uh, uh, it's one of the great joys for me. It's just to be in front of the work and to look at it, to think about it, to try to follow what it, yeah, how it was made, and, and also try to understand like what kind of uh, meaning could be, let's say, held in that process of this 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 work coming into being. Um, at the same time, I'm. Well, so for me, this this is a valuable moment because I am able to share it at another point. Hmm. Let's say. But how do you share it? Yeah, because I'm. Uh, you can look at the thing together. You can talk about it. You know, like I write about what I see, and I I, I, I give that to another person to, to think about it. Um, I think also you you see um, uh, like say intensifications of images that that preoccupy us in our everyday life. So you. Uh, let's say get another awareness mm. for your environment. It's let's say for me it's training a, a faculty, if you if you mm. will, like a, a kind 
kind of an ability that you, you, you try to get a, like a sensibility for a register that maybe otherwise escapes you. So let's say, for, for, let's say if, I, if I talk about it like that and I think about what we do with the mask, yeah. and, I'm, and I'm being really brutal in a way, I could say like for, for, for a Westerner, this is the, the biggest token of respect that you could give to it. It's by saying, okay, we capture it, we put it in a box and yeah. we look at it. Yeah. Yeah. Because we want to, let's say, have our own, let's say, uh, let's say the same kind of spiritual intensity that we have when we, when we stand and look for hours at our Mondrian's or at our Mayala Beach or yeah. Lady yeah. But, yeah, maybe that's something that, and I, I don't know, I mean, could you, do you think, you should, should you let that go? I mean, what, what, how do you? Yeah. It would be a bit like chopping chop on your head. Actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, yeah. The, the 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 cognitive emotional response that you have by looking at the picture is also because of the education. You, yeah, we you, right? trained like you've, that. you've been trained like you that. Drilled. Yeah, yeah. And I think in that sense, also the the usage of the mask and the seeing of the mask in certain contexts also gives that same type of cognitive emotional response. Mm -hmm. So it is. Uh, by placing it within a box, it is disciplining the object to be fit or to be understood within our context, yeah. instead of accepting it within its context and going towards its context to, to see what you can learn from it. I think it also comes to the notion of um, uh, decipherability, right? Mm -hmm. And some things will forever not be decipherable for us. Yeah. Um, uh, some some languages, some modes, some words. I mean, there are words that we can't translate. Even the Dutch word gezellig, right? You can't translate that. And I think that's also one of these interesting things about art. What exactly can you translate in modes of thinking, in modes of seeing, in modes of understanding the world? Yeah. We've chopped up the world to be able to understand it. But others see the world as something whole. We have a definition of death, right? Yeah. Which others don't. Also the notion of the number zero. The moment we got that number zero, we were able to see beyond the limitations we had before. So it's all about sharing these understandings and then seeing um, how do you make the world decipherable, but also how do you keep intact um, the opacity, right? How do you keep intact this notion that not everything needs to be understood in the same type of fashion, same type of way by everybody? Yeah, if you say it like that, like maybe if I think about, uh, maybe if you think about unlearning, like what, what could be unlearned in this, in, this, uh, in this setting, is that even in my, if, it, if it, let's say I'm, I'm trying to not be that, I think, but um, at the same time, I know that I'm not only trained to have this kind of a response to an artwork, which is maybe my own way to, and it's my let's say the, let's say the culture or community which I grew up in. That that's how I learned to appreciate art. But it's it's and you cannot say it's only culture. I mean, it just becomes part of your exactly. let's say of your being. Right. At the same time, what's also part of that attitude of that mentality is that uh, somehow I have very difficulty to accept that there is no solution to that let's say the particularity of that yeah. position. Yeah. And that yeah. if I think about it, it's maybe something in the way in which we, um, how it's related to our sense of communication. That, let's say exactly. we, 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 there is a sense in, a, in, 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 the, in, in maybe called Western communication that in a way doesn't really accept that there is a, let's say, that the other can have a real, let's say, a fundamentally different position, which is not about, let's say, in a, in a Hegelian sense of like being like the antithesis and the entities, exactly. but just being really, really different, just yeah. being not compatible. Yeah. Yeah. And, and at the same time being able to explain the same thing. I mean, once I, I have a, maybe I, maybe I should rethink my own text in that sense. I wrote a text once that said, let's say, what if the universe started here and elsewhere? And my idea was like, okay, you build your understanding of the world from your own place, yeah. but somebody else can do it a completely different way somewhere else. And maybe what we need to, Say, uh, find a human way to deal with is yeah. that, that that's fine. Exactly, <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah. It's acceptance of the difference and not seeing the difference as a competition, right? Mm -hmm. It's this notion of the competitiveness that we, in a sense, need to let go. Mm -hmm. And also, this notion of accumulation, the notion of ownership, this notion of the soul aura, right? Mm -hmm. All this is about competing with the other, but what if you stop competing? What if you just are? 
I think that's really interesting to think about, yeah. right? And how you make sure that um, just being is not destructive towards others. Because on the one hand, um, I'm talking about copies and copies being good, but as a maker of art, yeah. if someone copied my work, it, it happened recently. Someone was saying that they were the maker of my art. And I was like, what? What is this? And they were selling it for like 1,200 euros. I was like, no way. Yeah. Dude, what's going on here? And in that sense, the creation of the copy is destructive yeah. and is not towards a fundamental understanding of how do we come together and how do we um, share yeah. the understandings of the world that we have. So in that sense, the maker should not be left in the lurch when we create copies or when copies are made of the work. Yeah, there's also, I mean, there's a fundamental difference between, let's say, a fake and a copy. Exactly. Because a, a exactly. copy, in a sense, is, an, is a tribute, but it's a deliberate step away from a thing that exists. Uh, whereas a fake is something that tries to appear as something else exactly. and tries to take the credit for it. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, in that sense, I mean, like what I really learned from working with the Museum of American Art is that um, you cannot, if you, if you think about a copy, um, if you really take on, let's say, what's the consequences of allowing copies to have a, a place in the world that is, uh, let's say, equal to, to uh, the original, uh, it, it would mean that you need to rethink the whole system. Because, it, it, you, let's say, the copy lives from, in a way, a medieval world in which there is only one creator and it's God. I mean, it's, right. a, it's, it's the... And, and what you can do as human is you, you copy, you relate to yeah. that original creation. Oh. which is never within the human realm, in that, let's say, within the, the human reach. Exactly. Right. And then a copy is a much more, let's say, it's, um, it, it has a, um, a normal place or it has a logical place in the, in the system. In our, in our system, a copy is the intruder. It's, exactly. It's, a, it's, a, it's exactly. a strange guest. And I think we, we should look at one more place to um, yeah, maybe end our conversation or we, or we even go to somewhere else. <laughs> let's, go to <laughs> let's see. This gallery shows uh, eight exhibitions, and these are exhibitions that were uh, important for the, uh, the establishment, establishment of the narrative of modern art that is dominant within the West, and that also let's say, had a kind of an imperial effect on the, on the rest of the world in that sense. It shows two types of exhibitions. On the one hand, it shows two exhibitions that were exhibitions within the West that tried to suppress the history of, let's say, the story of modern art, and at the same time, it shows several collections, collectors, exhibitions that were important to establish that story of modern art. Um, and so we are looking here now at a display of the uh, Degenerate Art Exhibitions and Art der Kunst, which was held in uh, Germany in the time of the German, of the National Socialist uh, rule. And this was this famous exhibition where uh, modern art was made uh, let's say was mocked and later also removed from the galleries. Um, and I think if we, um, let's say if, we, if we talk about, let's say if we, if, we, if we go back to where we were a moment before thinking about, okay, how do you, let's say, find a way in which you can relate to the other in a positive way? Uh, I think this is such a, let's say, a, let's say, iconical example, almost mythical example by now, because we don't really care so much for, let's say, the real political struggle that was waged with Antarctica to Kunz, because in a way, Antarctica to Kunz was as much, a, uh, let's say, the set establishment of a dispute within the National Socialist Party, because in the National Socialist Party, there were a lot of people who were in favor of expressionism, which was considered to be German because it was expressive and kind of romantic. Uh, but Hitler, of course, wouldn't have it because he loved this kind of Biedermeier art. And so he said, this all goes out. Um, and so, uh, in a way, he, like, this was as much a confrontation to his own party members as it was, let's say, an attack on the, on the, on the modern art. Um, but we care for it. That's much more about, let's say, being an exhibition that's such a, let's say, a, a horrible gesture of excluding the other, excluding others, excluding a position. Um, at the same time, I wonder now if, let's say, by being so, let's say, uh, overly self-righteous and saying, okay, they did the most horrible thing, they, they, they mocked and they ridiculed this art, 
and this should never be done because you have to respect this kind of art or you have to respect all kind of positions in the world. But somehow, it, let's say that, let's say reflection on that horror never brought us to a position where we thought, okay, we have to, um, let's say, um, really go into, into, really explore into the fundamental, fundamentals of our systems of thinking, like how is it, let's say, what would it mean to be, to really say yes to, let's say, somebody else who comes to the door or to another position that exists. Because, because maybe this turn, maybe this, the way in which we've worked with uh, the, the Antarctic Kunst exhibition in the Western culture, uh, perhaps it has been also a way in which we say, okay, um, we have turned it into a, a weapon for our own self-righteousness. I'm not sure, but it's just a... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, difficult question. In the sense that this is, on the one hand, talking about technologies of exhibitioning, right? But also the technologies of exhibitioning um, being able to be part of this genocidal rage. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I find it difficult then to relate to a discussion about this um, um, as, as the gesture being normal, right? Or the gesture being something that could be seen as... No, I, but what I, that's what I mean. What I mean is that, let's say, this exhibition has received, and in a way we are, uh, let's say, emphasize, we're, we're, we're standing on the shoulders of that tradition by making this exhibit. Mm -hmm. Let's say the way in which this exhibition has been received in the West post-war is that this is pure evil. Yeah. You, you cannot do this. And, um, and I would agree. I mean, I think it's a horrible thing that they did. But um, it maybe it reminds me of what we were talking about in front of the mosque um, in the sense that um, we, we are, or maybe more in how we talked about the relationship of Eindhoven being an industrial force and at the same time, uh, let's say, not understanding itself as being a cultural force and not thinking the two things together. That we can, we can, from a cultural, symbolical perspective, say this is the most horrible thing that to do and you should never do it. But we don't think that not doing it would have further consequences than simply not doing it. But perhaps, let's say, the, the world of ideas out of which this gesture came from is not just, um, uh, let's say, pure evil, but it's, it, this, this was a, a very modern exhibition in many ways. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say this was, uh, this, like a, a lot of, there is also a narrative that says what, what, so, what the West found so difficult about the Second World War, that, that there were, let's say, technologies of colonial, uh, colonialism uh, returning home. Yeah. Yeah. And that, um, yeah. um, and that, let's say our, and then we go back again to let's say our system of property ownership, authorship, uniqueness, originality. Well, let's say the, let's say the celebration of uniqueness in, in the in the national uh, socialist uh, mytho mythology ideology it was enormous. I mean, they they celebrated that like like crazy. In that sense, it, it wasn't an anti-modern uh, yeah. ideology. It was a it was an object inversion, but, but it was very much in line with, 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 with maybe some kind of modern thinking. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, that's what I mean, like, are we, how should, like, again, it's the question, let's say, what should we learn from it? Like, yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's once again thinking through the technologies themselves as being problematic, as being able to lend themselves towards this type of destructive moment. Yeah, I, th I think that's an interesting question. Because then it once again troubles the notion of the modern art museum as not just an empty vessel, right? That the modern art museum is not itself capable of doing this. This is not just a question of someone else coming here with a bad intention and changing it. No, the tool's already set in motion. The tool's already there. And if the tool's already there, then it's a question of how do you remove the tools and can you rehabilitate the tools? Can you represent, represent the museum, uh, the modern art museum, or the notion of modern art um, towards something that is healing, that is reparative, instead of, you know? Yeah. 
yeah. being being able to be used for such an abject project as national socialism. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think the, yeah. the let's say the yeah. the. the Let's say what I find so, let's say, profoundly conflicting in a way is that um, on the one hand, let's say my understanding of art, uh, like my, my, my the training I talked about, is, like, is, is dealt with this kind of, let's say, what you call, could call a Rancherian idea of aesthetics. Mm -hmm. uh, this idea that, um, let's say, aesthetics is a very human emotion or a very human, let's say, uh, um, uh, practice, uh, cognitive practice. Whereby you, which even if you, even if the language, of course, of philosophy you describes it in a quite detailed and maybe not always the most accessible manner, but for me, let's say the most the simple part of it is that um, it describes how, through let's say through the dialogue, through the through the dynamic between experience and uh, trying to let's say uh, work with concepts on that experience, you let's say establish a relationship to the things that you do not know yet. To what's not known. I mean, Rancher calls it kind of the everyday adventure of exploring, let's say, of, 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 of knowing the world. And let's say, aesthetic, um, aesthetics, uh, but also the experience of art, is in a way a practice in which we highlight, in which we make much more, uh, which we put uh, uh, the spotlight on this, let's say, forcing ourselves more or less to confront ourselves with the unknown. Maybe like what we do now, let's say asking these questions about what can we learn from this. I, I don't know yet. Mm -hmm. Maybe hopefully one day is more, but not yet. Um, so that's, that's my, 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 and that's, that's for me a very important ethical uh, mechanism because it's how you are able to, let's say, uh, look, at the, look at difference. And at the same time, the place, the house where that Experience and the, and the institutions where that experience uh, um, should be celebrated, should be activated, should exist. Their, their mechanisms are so deeply ingrained into a uh, system ex of exclusivity mm. and of taking outside. And it, let's say, if you think about it, it's a maybe not a very sh charming world at the moment, but inclusion. Like, the, the museum, like even if we, even we, I mean, we have difficulty with being inclusive yeah. as an institution, whereas it's maybe the, the one thing that I think that based on my ethical understanding of art, what art is, what it should do. Yeah. Yeah. But because we are maybe captured in that system of originality, identity, uniqueness, celebrating this, let's say, always, always putting, putting that almost in a hierarchical way above somebody else and saying, well, you will never really achieve that, but you can walk a bit in that direction. That, that's the other side of that coin. And um, yeah, that's, that's a very, so I don't, I mean, again, it's not about something that I, I know the answer to, but in talking with you about it here, I do feel that um, I understand better why we, why we had so many copies in this exhibition. Because it somehow, it, it helps us to, it liberates us a bit yeah. from our system. So, what do you think we should do? I think we should have a cup of tea. And a cookie. <laughs> and, and, and think about the technologies that we use to present our deepest thoughts to the rest of us. Good. Well, let's do that then. And, uh, well, let's end this conversation by turning again to the camera and say thank you very much for uh, joining us for this conversation. And I hope you will enjoy the rest of the program of the Internationale on the Internationale online today. And um, yeah, uh, please follow us on the website and also uh, come and uh, let's say be puzzled, as puzzled as we are about these copies here in this museum. So thank you very much. These two next to each other, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, wow. Yeah. Maybe we should walk away. Hmm? Walk out of it. We could walk.